just, um, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me because we don't have a mic, so in the back, okay? All right, again, I'm Mrs. Greenberg. For those of you that don't know me, I teach Spanish. Um, and just to give you kind of like the overview of what's going to happen today, I'm going to give my talk. We're going to look at a lot of pictures. Um, I'm certainly open to taking any questions if you have any at the end of the talk. And then if we have extra time, you're welcome to chat and relax a little bit and meet in class. Um, sound good? Cool. Okay, so again, Mrs. Greenberg, or Senora Greenberg, as most people know me, um, and those of you who have had me as a teacher know that I'm a huge fan of other cultures, um, specifically Spanish-speaking cultures, um, which is manifested through my love of travel and the fact that I've been lucky enough to do a lot of traveling. And I really debated about including the next um, slide in my PowerPoint presentation because I didn't want to come off as like braggy, but I'm going to show you all of the places that I've traveled to on the next slide. Um, I have traveled to non-Spanish-speaking countries as well, but the focus of my talk today is going to be some of those Spanish-speaking cultures and countries, so here we go. Okay, so, the Spanish-speaking world. I have been to Mexico eight times. It's my favorite. I love it. Guatemala. Honduras. The Dominican Republic. That's kind of just a vacation. Not super cultural. I was at a resort. It's beautiful, though. Been to Spain three times. I've been in Nicaragua twice, it's a wonderful country. Costa Rica twice. Been to Panama. I've been to Colombia. Been to Ecuador. I've been to Peru twice. I've been to Chile. And I've been to Argentina. Okay. So um, I hope that that speaks to um, my credibility to kind of give this talk and um, <laughs> the fact that I actually have had these experiences based off of um, these numbers and, and the amount of countries that are up there. So um, again, traveling, I love it. I've done it a lot, as you can see. Um, I've been really lucky to find a partner, my husband, who also likes to travel a lot. So a lot of the pictures that I'm gonna show you today, he's in many of them. And some of my favorite experiences while traveling have included things like uh, dressing like the locals. Um, here we are in Peru. Um, and this is me in Guatemala. I've had my hair done like a traditional Guatemalan woman. Um, being a super nerd about pre-Columbian civilizations, Mayans, Aztecs, um, Incan. This is Mexico City. This is me in Colombia. <laughs> the whole photo series of myself and my husband imitating statues were really cool. Um, visiting famous cultural and historical sites. This is Machu Picchu in Peru. This is Palenque in Mexico. Um, I think you'll like these next pictures visiting some of the best beaches in the world. This is a beach in Colombia. Another beach in Colombia. <laughs> this is Mexico. Nicaragua. Great beaches. <laughs> this is a beach in Mexico that also has Mayan ruins on it, so combining those two things. Beach in Ecuador. Can you see what's in the picture? The sea lions, yep. And this is one of my favorite beaches in Mexico, where I actually went two Christmases ago when I was six months pregnant. Um, so the, our little son got to swim in that ocean before it was born. And one of my favorite cultural experiences um, is trying as many new foods. <laughs> this is Guatemala, to mango. This is Mexico. Mexico. Me posing with fruit in Peru. <laughs> Um, again, this is Peru. And new beverages, the coconut, um, as possible. So this is Colombia again, Guatemala. I've liked some of the places that I've traveled to so much that my husband and I decided to get married in one of them. Um, so yeah, these are pictures from our wedding in Oaxaca, Mexico. We did a photo shoot in the city, so we um, you know, got, got dressed. So I was in my wedding dress, my husband was in a suit. And we walked around the city taking pictures of some of the places that we really like. Um, this is a woman named Magdalena, who is from Oaxaca, where I got married. And she pretty much single-handedly planned our wedding for us, and also did not want to accept any money from us for doing so. Um, I'm going to talk about her later, because she's a really incredible person. One of the many incredible people that I've been lucky enough to meet. So these trips have taught me a lot about the world, especially and obviously the Spanish-speaking world. Um, and they've also given me a lot of insight into my own life and experience as a citizen of the United States. 
I'm here to talk to you today about some of my travel experiences and how they have helped me develop a greater understanding of and empathy for people of different countries, races, religions, etc. So often, we only hear a single story about people from other countries. And that story often serves to emphasize the differences rather than the similarities between these people and ourselves. Yes, there are many differences between our cultures here in the United States and the cultures that I have experience with. And I'm going to talk about those differences. But what's more important and what we have to all remember is that at the end of the day, we are all humans. And we all want and need the same things. Basic things like food, water, clothing, but also love, security, education, happiness. And we are all more alike than you might have imagined. And so this global perspective and the sense of cultural sensitivity and understanding are qualities that are incredibly important for success in our world today as we become, as we become a more globalized uh, world. And so my hope is that maybe through this talk and through these pictures, <coughs> I'll get you to think a little bit differently about some things and hopefully inspire all of you to find similar opportunities to the ones that I've had myself. So with all that being said, I want all of you to know that I wasn't always like this. I wasn't always super interested in travel and other cultures and other languages. As many of you know, I attended Padua Academy many years ago at this point. I've lived most of my life in Delaware. And my first real experience with another country outside of family vacations didn't happen until my senior year in college, so when I was about 21. I decided at the beginning of my senior year at UD that I wanted to spend spring semester in Mexico. So I enrolled in an exchange program with La Universidad de las Americas in Puebla, Mexico. I really didn't know much about Mexico, aside from the standard cultural tidbit that you get in most Spanish classes. Things like Mayans, Aztecs, tacos, tequila, Pyramids, beaches, poverty, of course, immigration to the U.S., both legal and illegal. I was guilty of only knowing a single story, um, the single story that we are so commonly told about Mexico. And I really didn't take it upon myself to educate myself about the area that I would be spending four months in. In fact, previous to my departure, I actually told people that I was going to a completely different city in Mexico called San Luis Potosí, and I don't know why I did that. It was just that I really didn't take it upon myself to do any sort of research into the place that I was ultimately going. Um, so really, until I was about 21, I was actually pretty culturally insensitive. Um, and by the way, this is where I thought I was going. <laughs> this is uh, Mexico and Epcot Center in Disney World. Um, and while I'm sure Epcot has gotten some things right, about Mexico, um, it's largely a stereotype based off of what we're commonly told about Mexico people and traditions. Uh, so I did not spend four months in a scene from It's a Small World. This is actually where I lived in Mexico. This is my street. My house is on the left hand side. You can see that somebody drives a Jeep Cherokee. This is where I took classes every day. This is my university. Beautiful. Beautiful. We often had class in uh, the Zen Garden. Lovely. And this is where I, I ate lunch every day. This is the patio outside the cafeteria. And the weather in this particular city is amazing. So it was 75 degrees and sunny every day, so we literally had lunch every day at the patio. And these are some of my friends when I was there. This is Samuel. And you're going to see a lot of pictures of myself when I was a little bit younger and had um, a lot lighter hair. So please don't judge me. Um, this is my friend Sol and her boyfriend Charlie. This is my friend Jaime, my friend Stella, my friend Jacobo, and these are all still people that I keep in touch with. Um, and for the most part, we were all interested in the same things. We all wore the same kind of clothes with similar taste in music. In fact, while I was attending the, the university, Shakira actually came and did a concert at the University of the Americas, and it was amazing. So to be completely honest, I was actually really surprised about how similar I was to many of the people that I met in Mexico. And this is something that I'm reminded of every time I travel anywhere. All countries have big cities with modern buildings. 
and well-maintained neighborhoods. This is actually where I got married in Mexico. Many places that I visited in Latin America are actually nicer than the neighborhood that I grew up in or where I currently live now. But when we constantly refer to other countries as foreign and to the people from them as foreigners, it's easy to think that everything about these places is strange and different. Using the term foreign alone creates an us versus them idea that it's often hard to shake unless you really make an effort to get out and see the world. Uh, which, if you haven't guessed by now, I'm encouraging all of you to do. Because I think that you will be surprised, and pleasantly, pleasantly so, about just how similar we all are. However, on the other end of the spectrum, the differences between my day-to-day -day experience in the US and that of many people in Latin America also surprised me. My first real encounter with poverty was through my travels. In the US, we also have poverty, the same kind in many cases that I observed while traveling, crushing extreme poverty. But if you're anything like me, I didn't have many experiences with poverty in my own country because I never really ventured too far out of my community, my hometown. So it took me traveling to another country to experience poverty for the first time. And initially, it was very shocking. As I said, my first real experience in another country was a four-month study abroad program to Mexico. And by the end of my time there, the experience of daily poverty <coughs> on my walk to school, at the market, at the orphanage where I volunteered, had left me with a real sense of desperation and helplessness for the people around me. Another thing that has had a profound impact on me is the phenomenon of child labor that is so common in the countries to which I have traveled. I have seen children as young as three years old selling posters on street corners. <coughs> or performing on local buses for spare change. <laughs> Some children sell souvenirs to travelers. Or work in local markets. These children earn just pennies a day in many cases and also miss out on the opportunity to attend school because they are forced to work and contribute to their family's incomes. I think of these children and these pictures whenever I hear people commenting on the current immigration issues we are facing as a country. Child labor, extreme poverty, poor living conditions. These are the reasons for much of our immigration from Latin America. And these are the faces of the people who are escaping these conditions. But despite some of these conditions, or maybe because of, because of them, I have also seen a great deal of happiness and goodness, incredible works of charity and hospitality in my trips. Seeing children play and pose for pictures in Honduras, or play with bubbles, in Honduras or Guatemala, kids love bubbles, anywhere you go. <laughs> Dress up in Peru, or laugh and dance in their classroom in Panama. Remind me again of just how similar we all are. And seeing the overwhelming commitment to good and to improving the lives of many of these people is another thing that fills me with great hope. So I said I was going to talk about Magdalena again. This is the woman who helped plan my wedding, or planned my wedding, essentially. So here she is. Um, she is one of the many inspiring people that I've had the pleasure of getting to know through my travels. Magdalena runs a small inn in the city of Oaxaca, Mexico, where I was married, in addition to giving cooking lessons and running a laundry service in order to make ends meet. Magdalena is not wealthy and she struggles every day to keep food on the table. 
cover the cost of uniforms and books for her school-aged children, and take care of her aging mother and two new grandchildren. In spite of this, she is also extremely charitable. The areas surrounding the city of Oaxaca are very rural um, and have a large indigenous presence. Often these areas lack schools, and so children grow up without access to education, and then are only able to obtain low-paying jobs that are often very physically demanding. Knowing this, Magdalena offers young children from these surrounding areas the opportunity to stay at her inn and attend school in the city. She covers all of the costs associated with attending school in exchange for help at her inn, doing things like washing dishes, making beds, preparing meals, things that we all did growing up. Uh, on the right is a child named Felipe, and this is the first time I met him in 2011. He was about uh, 10 years old, 11 years old at that point. He was one of the children staying with Magdalena when I first met her. Just last year, I went back to stay with Magdalena again, and Felipe was still there. He is in high school now, and he's studying to be a teacher. And it's something that he would not have had the opportunity to do had it not been for somebody like Magdalena. <coughs> so my husband and I tried to send um, Magdalena school supplies, clothing, small amounts of money whenever we can so that she can contribute to make education a, po a possibility for children who otherwise would never have the opportunity. These are our children from the Nuevo Manasea Orphanage in Lima, Peru. Many of these children are not orphans in the sense of the word that you and I know, because many of them still have parents. However, due to low paying jobs, poor labor conditions, or the lack of jobs altogether, some parents in Peru and other countries cannot afford to raise their children. Sometimes the parents realize this and willingly bring their children to places like Nuevo Manasea for help. However, in other cases, parents obligate their children to work to help cover the costs of raising a family. And it is often the nature of the job that draws the attention and the intervention of an institution like Nuevo Manasea. Some of the girls that I met while volunteering at the home had been forced to prostitute themselves in order to raise money for their families. <laughs> Thankfully, places like Nuevo Manasea exist to remove children from situations like this and help to rehabilitate them and send them to school so that they can avoid falling into the cycle of child labor. The two women from Lima, Peru, who ran the home <coughs> while I volunteered were incredibly selfless people who received very little or no pay at all to provide all the incredible services that they do for the young people in this community. There are many institutions all over Latin America, all over the world, like Nuevo Manasea, that are constantly looking for volunteers and donations to be able to continue to provide for children, just like Soledad, who's in the middle, Esther on the left, or Pilar on the right. So in closing, I hope that I have given all of you more than just a single story about some of the places that I've mentioned today. I hope that you come to see the many differences around the world as a call to learn more about and serve the people who need our help, and that our similarities remind you that we are all in this together. I encourage all of you to explore the world, and please know that you can do this without ever leaving the country. You can watch movies or programs from or about other countries. I have many recommendations if you're interested. You can try to educate yourself on issues that are important to you on a global level. Or you can even just follow Instagram accounts for other countries. Again, if you need recommendations, come see me. I follow about 20 accounts from Colombia alone, and it's awesome looking at the pictures. And when and if you're ready, go see the world. You will get to meet people who will change your life.
you'll get to experience incredible places and events and beaches. And in taking that risk, you'll become a better version of the person you already are. Thank you, Ross. to do, to be successful in doing it, 
gives you such a feeling of empowerment, and as women, it's such an incredible feeling. But certainly there are safety risks involved. So if it's something that you're contemplating, I would say make sure that you research the area that you're going to a lot. Um, but I recommend it, and I do think that there is a very safe um, way of traveling independently. Danielle? Did you think that uh, if you came, being able to speak Spanish was one of the most like, the best way to play <laughs> Did you find that being able to speak the language was the only way you were able to be in that environment? The great question. Um, no, but it certainly helps. And you'll find um, anywhere you travel to where a different language is spoken, if you make an effort to speak that language, people are so appreciative of it. Um, it certainly really opened the door for my husband and I, the fact that we do both speak Spanish. Um, I think that we were able to have a lot of experiences that maybe not your average traveler has if they're not willing to, to speak the language. But I don't think it's necessary. Um, because I think anywhere you go nowadays, most places that you go nowadays, many people will speak English. Um, and they're just happy to meet people from other countries. So I don't think that you necessarily have to speak the language to travel to another country. Yeah. Can you use the term abroad during college? Do you like recommend that? And do you think that that's a good way to start traveling? Yes, and it's absolutely how I started. Had I not done that, I would not have had all these experiences because it really gave me that travel bug. Um, I actually did two study abroad programs at the University of Delaware. I highly recommend looking into um, study abroad programming at any university that you attend. UD has some of the best programming out there, and it's incredibly affordable, if, especially you're in-state. So I did um, my entire spring semester, my um, senior year, I, I did in Mexico, amazing. And then that summer, um, I begged my parents to allow me to stay on for one more semester in college, and I did a summer semester in Spain, the five-week program, right afterwards, right back to back, I was Mexico and then I was Spain. And it was really neat to have that, that cultural experience of, of seeing Latin America and then seeing Spain, you know, European Spain, um, and that absolutely is what led me to future trips. Just having those two experiences so close to each other, um, really falling in love with people from other countries, and something that I didn't really talk about, but that um, you will find if you start to travel, when you start to travel, is that in traveling, you meet a lot of other travelers, and they just really um, inspire you to keep seeing other places. They give you recommendations in many cases. They kind of like keep that, that fire, um, to, to travel lit as well. Um, and there's a lot of lit. <laughs> a lot of people from Europe and from Australia that do a lot of traveling. Um, so we also now have friends all over Europe and all over Australia that we've met through our travels in Latin America. So really, it is just the best way to meet people from other countries. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah. Where were you Aha, it's not. I mean, when I, so, um, back up. I began traveling in college, I traveled through graduate school, and then I have traveled um, as a teacher here at So being a teacher is really the most fantastic job because you have breaks and you can do things on those breaks. Um, so uh, the first summer that I was a teacher here at Padua, my husband and I went to Peru for five weeks, five weeks traveling the country. Um, and as I said, it's so affordable once you get there, we didn't have to work in country um, to be able to afford that kind of, of trip. Um, the following summer, I did a program in Mexico, so I was in Mexico for six weeks over the summer. And then the following summer, we went to Colombia for five weeks. And again, <coughs> the prices um, for food, for lodging, for transportation are so affordable that we would work hard during the year, save, save up enough money for the plane ticket, and then once we got there, we were just, you know, using twenty, thirty dollars a day to sustain ourselves. So, um, traveling, especially within Latin America, is something that you can afford in many cases um, with just a regular job or as college students. All right. Do you have to do like it depends on the program, certainly. Um, I, no, I don't think so. Um, the programs that I went on, the Mexico program that I did, I had um, I was a Spanish major, but I was also an international relations major. We had somebody who was a chemist. We had somebody who was an engineer. Um, you know, certainly there are some programs that are tailored for a specific program or a specific major. But for the most part, um, universities and colleges just want you to travel, so they're going to allow you to do um, a program that is of interest to you.
Okay. Okay. That's hard. Um, usually my answer is Colombia or Nicaragua, which are two places that most people don't really think to travel to. Colombia certainly has um, kind of a more negative connotation um, because some of the things that happened in the 90s with Pablo Escobar, watch <laughs> narcos. Um, but it's been quite some time since that was the case, and I'll tell you what, people in Colombia, the Colombian people, are so happy to have other people, people from other countries now being tourists. They're just so appreciative of that, that we met some of the nicest people ever in Colombia. People that wanted us to come over for dinner. Um, my husband and I were taking a subway, uh, taking the subway in Medellin, Colombia, and we just happened to notice a mom and her daughter just chatting and playing um, on the subway, and then we all got off at the same stop, and my husband and I were trying to get a taxi to go back to um, our hostel, and this mother just said, oh, like, come, let, come with us. Come with us. We'll take you back to your hostel. We're, gonna, we're going the same way. Um, so we got in, we chatted. The little girl was adorable. And then when we got out to go to our hostel, tried to pay, the woman wouldn't, al wouldn't allow us to pay. Um, it wasn't much money, but she said, no, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to Colombia. Thank you for seeing what we're really like. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Colombia was such a special place for me. And it's beautiful. It's incredibly beautiful. Nicaragua is the same thing. Um, not many people tend to go there. Um, it's, it is a very poor country, um, but it is incredibly beautiful, and the people are incredibly um, enthused to have tourists there. So I recommend those too, highly. Yep. Um, I'm about to go to Nicaragua. Like, what would be like a good place to like see? <laughs> That's awesome. Are you going with a program or? Um, well, I'm going with like my family over spring break and we're helping to build houses. Oh my god, that's wonderful. So um, my favorite places in Nicaragua are Lake Nicaragua, which has an island in the middle of it called Obetepe. Two volcanoes on it, you can climb both of them and get great views of like pretty much the whole country. Um, the beaches on the Pacific side of Nicaragua are incredible. One of the pictures that I showed is from a beach called Hiquelillo, um, which I recommend, I can write it down if you want. And then Nicaragua has a really good coffee culture. I don't know if you guys like coffee, some of you do. Um, there's an area called Macagalpa in northern uh, Nicaragua that has really great coffee, great scenery, and some of the nicest people I've ever met. So I'm happy to, to make some recommendations for you. I'm so happy you're going there. That's wonderful. Anything else, ladies? Yeah, oh, hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, was there anything that you did on your first trip abroad that you look back now and cringe and think, I was such an ugly American, other than obviously you thought you were going to have hat. Like, is there anything that you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, like, that was such an ugly American move, like, I would never do that now? Yes, but I don't know if it's something that I can share. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, certainly a lot of that is age as well. Like, I mean, I, I said I was 21 when I went, um, which sounds probably old for you, but it's it actually, I was incredibly immature as a 21-year-old. Um, so, um, you know, it was my first time being abroad with, without my family. Um, I was with a group of college students, um, you know, so. I certainly took advantage of that lifestyle um, that I look back at that now and I think like, oh, perhaps I should have done more like studying or, um, you know, some, some more um, individual travel. But um, it's all about the learning process. It's all about growing, you know. Um, I certainly, as I've gotten older, I've had a more, I've had a greater appreciation, obviously, for other cultures. Um, but the fact that I spent four months in Mexico as my first experience ever, Within that time, I also did a lot of growing. So I was a different person <coughs> when I arrived and when I left Mexico, um, and like, largely due to that experience. Like I would not be who I am if I had not done that. So um, if there's no more questions, you guys have we have about five more minutes. Um, so feel free to just chat. And if anybody ever wants to talk to you about any of these things. I'm happy to talk about them further. As you can tell, I love to talk about traveling and other cultures and other people. And again, my just takeaway, please go see the world if you want to. Don't feel like I'm forcing you to, but it is amazing. And it'll change your life. Thank you.